Today's passage from the book of Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10, through chapter 13, verse 1. Zechariah 12, 10 through 13, 1. I will pour out of the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be great, like the weeping of, of Halid Rimen in the plain of Megadog. The land will mourn each clan by itself, with their wives by themselves, the clan of the house of David and their wives, the clan of the house of Nathan and their wives, the clan of the house of Levi and their wives, the clan of Shimei and their wives, the, and all the rest of the clans and all their wives. On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and all inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. There's an old story from a few years back about a man who was doing his Christmas shopping. And like some of those guys tend to do, he had waited to the last minute. And now he was stressed out. He was tired of fighting the crowds, and the last three stores he had been to didn't have what he needed, and the entire town felt like just one big traffic jam. He felt like he had spent more time that day standing in line than the rest of the year combined. And now he was waiting for an elevator. The last three elevator cars to come by had been so full he couldn't fit in. Finally, another one opened, and he decided to push his way in, and people pressed against each other, and he scrunched in as the elevator doors closed. He said out loud, whoever came up with Christmas should be strung up and shot. And a few people in the elevator kind of grumbled in agreement. Then someone in the back said, don't worry. They already crucified him. Christmas should be a time of joy. But for a lot of people, it's a time of stress. And today I want to talk about some people who knew what stress was like. Today we return to the book of Zechariah. And in Zechariah's day, the people knew pressure and anxiety and stress. The exile was over. They were back in their homeland. It would seem like a time to rejoice. But being back in their homeland was not all they imagined. Their Cities were ghost towns, their fields were overgrown, their homes were in shambles. Most important from Zechariah's point of view, the temple of the Lord was still in ruins. After an initial burst of energy, people had given up work on the temple. They had their own homes to build, they had their own problems to deal with. There was just too much to do and too much stress to handle. But Zechariah said that the temple was a symbol of the people's relationship with God. Without the temple, they weren't the people of God. They were just the guys living in Jerusalem. He called the people back to rebuild the temple. But really, this got a much deeper issue for the Israelites, a, a deeper question. The question was, could they get back to where they were before. They had been the people of God. Was that still true? They had turned away from the Lord and they were suffering the consequences of that sin. Were they forgotten? The resounding response from Zechariah is, you are not forgotten. God was still with his people and God would not forget them. Zechariah opened his book with the Lord saying to his people, return to me and I will return to you. The name Zechariah means the Lord remembers. God had not forgotten his people and God would not forget his people. Now, for Zechariah and for the prophet Haggai, this was a call to rebuild the temple. And rebuilding the temple was a largely symbolic act, but symbols matter. In calling the people to rebuild the temple, Zechariah was saying, it's not too late. 
just as this temple can be rebuilt, your relationship with God can be rebuilt. What's lost can be found again. What's been taken can be regained. For the Israelites, this meant they could be the people of God again. They could be restored to the Lord. They had lost so much, but God was at work to bring them back. As I read this, I can't help but see a connection in our world today. 2020 has been a tough year for a lot of people. We have faced this deadly pandemic. We've dealt with a serious economic setback. We've seen one of the most bitter presidential elections in our history. And given our history, that's really saying something. People are struggling, and they wonder, can we get back to where we were before? I think for Zechariah, the answer is, we can make it back. We are not forgotten. God is at work. He is not simply given, he's not allowed the possibility of return. He is actively at work to make it happen, to bring his people back to him. We can be restored. For Zechariah, that begins with the pouring out of God's Spirit. Zechariah began today's passage by saying that, by God saying, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. It starts with God pouring out his spirit. On Christmas, we celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ has been born. But this holiday is about more than just that single birth. I mean, certainly it's about that birth, but it's about so much more. Because in Jesus' birth, God was preparing the way to send his Holy Spirit to us. He was preparing to pour out his spirit on his people. Now, I occasionally hear people talk about the Old Testament. They talk about the, how God seemed more active. And they said, wouldn't that be great if he, God was performing these miracles and doing amazing things and God was present with his people? And I get the appeal to that. But all of that stuff, the crossing the Red Sea or leading the people by a pillar of fire at night, a pillar of cloud by day, and all of that, it's all external stuff. It's all things that God was doing around the people. It can't compare with what God is doing today because now God's spirit lives within us. God is at work in our hearts. If Jesus Christ is your Lord, then the Holy Spirit lives in you and he is at work in your life. In Zechariah's day, God could restore a nation. Today, he restores our souls. His Spirit lives within us to restore us. And so God has given us a spirit of grace and supplication. Supplication means to ask for something earnestly and humbly. Grace means to give something undeserved without expecting anything in return. That is the spirit that God has given us today. A spirit of grace and supplication. That is his gift to us this Christmas. A spirit that lets us give and receive freely. And then, Zechariah... Give me another slide, Kendall. Then Zechariah said that God wasn't simply sending his spirit from a distance. He was coming into our world to do this. Zechariah said that God said to the people... They will look upon me, whom they have pierced, and they will mourn. There's two really important thoughts in that one sentence. First, the one who was born on Christmas Day would have to be pierced. And Jesus Christ came to die for us. He was born that he could be pierced. That he could suffer for our iniquities. That he could take our sin from us. Christmas is a time of joy. More than any other season, this is a holiday to rejoice, to shout for joy. But it's also important to re remember that Christmas is really just the setup. Christmas only matters because of what happened on Easter. That Jesus was pierced for us 
that he died for us and that he is alive today. The second important thing to remember that to learn from that sentence is that God is the one doing the work. God is doing the heavy lifting here. When Jesus was on trial before the Sanhedrin, someone asked him, point blank, are you the Christ, the Son of God? They were saying, are you God in the flesh? And Jesus said, yes, you've got it right. And everyone was shocked, and they tore their clothes, and they shouted blasphemy. I have to wonder why they were so surprised, because this is what God said he was going to do. In Zechariah, God said, they will look on me, the one they have pierced. God was not simply going to cause all this to happen from heaven. God said, I'm coming down to earth. I'm going to be the one they see. I'm going to be the one they pierce. God was doing the heavy lifting here. For the Israelites, this meant that God would cleanse them of sin, that God would restore them as a nation. And still in our lives today, God is the one who does the heavy lifting. God is the one who has borne our sins, who has been pierced for us, who has died and who has risen from the dead. He's the one doing this work. We live in a world with, filled with people who will say, this is how you restore your soul. We have a God who says, I will restore your soul. When we turn to Christ, he does the work. He doesn't demand that we restore ourselves. He is the one who restores our soul. Too often we, we think we have to do this ourselves. We have to find a way to, to make everything right. But we have a God who restores us. He is the one who does the heavy lifting. He restores our souls. And then Zechariah tells us how this will be accomplished. Zechariah, having said that God will come and be pierced for us, that he will do this work. Zacharias says that a fountain will be opened to, to the house of David and the people of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and inequity. We have a God who has come to make us clean. And again, I think too often we think we have to do this ourselves. We think we have to find a way to make this work. We have to find the perfect gift that will make everyone happy. We have to set up the perfect set of decorations that will lift people's spirits. We have to cook the perfect meal that will leave everybody satisfied. We have to find a way to make it right ourselves. But we have a God who says he is going to do the work. He is going to restore us. And says he will do this by cleansing us of sin and impurity. And we need that. In Zechariah's day, the people needed to be cleansed. They had turned away from God. They were suffering the results of their sin, and they needed to be cleansed. Still today, we need to be made clean. We need to be cleansed of the sin and the impurity of this world. And the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And when we see God, we are renewed in our souls. We are restored. The challenge is that nothing in this world is pure. Not really. Explorers have melted snow off the cap of the North Pole itself. I'm assuming they got Santa's permission for this. They melted snow off a glacier from the North Pole, and they found it was not 100% pure water. There's no pure water in the world. The most sophisticated purification systems that people have ever created cannot make water perfectly pure. And if we can't even find pure water in this world, what hope is there of finding a pure heart? What we need is a cleansed heart. We need this fountain that cleanses us from sin and impurity. For that to happen, we need to turn to the God who cleanses us. We need to repent and recognize our own sin. We need to 
recognize our bitterness, our lack of compassion, our unforgiveness, our irritability, or even childish cruelty. And when we recognize our sin, we turn to the God who cleanses us, then he renews our spirits. He restores our souls. This has been a rough year for a lot of people. There's no way around that fact. Many people have suffered in a lot of ways. And it leaves us wondering, can we find our way back? Can we be restored? The message of Zachariah is yes. There is hope. There is a chance to be restored. God has done the work. He has sent his son into this world. He has been pierced for us. He has cleansed us. When we turn to him in repentance, then he makes us clean. He removes the sin and impurity of this world, and he renews our souls. I know that there's been a lot of struggle. But at least for us, at least for the people who turn to Christ, there is hope. God has come into our world. Love has become a man. Hope is alive. And so this Christmas, with everything going on in the world, we still have a reason to rejoice. We still find our hope and our joy in the living God. Because whatever this world throws at us, our God is alive and we have been renewed. In a moment, we're going to stand for our invitation hymn. And as we stand to sing, if you need that, if you need to be renewed, if you've been trying to do this yourself, if you've been trying to renew your own soul, and finding that it's just not working, if you need the God who restores your soul, you have an opportunity. I ask you to stand with me for an invitation here, which is Silent Night, and we'll sing all the verses. <laughs>